All right, gathering, how we doing tonight? Doing good? Hey, I want to give a quick shout out just really, really, really quickly. Uh, 30 minutes before we started tonight, we had a uh, power outage and our AV team had to reboot everything. They had like hydraulic lifts in here in the ceiling and getting it all ready for y'all. So we can give the AV team a, a thank you for moving in at the last second, rebooting everything and, and just, man, really appreciate that. Uh, speaking of learning new skills, I don't know how to do AV stuff, but there's one thing that I did learn when I was in my college years, and that was how to set up a portable sound system. One of the most helpful things to learn ever, like wherever you go, you know, if you're, if it's volleyball or a, or a cookout, barbecue, whatever, where you work at a camp, you work at a, in a ministry, like, that's a good thing to know, is how to set that up. And there's a lot of good things that we learn when our, we're young adults, that there's, there's a moment where you're like, oh, I didn't know that before. And here's the, the next thought is, why did no one teach me how to do this? Right, like we have those moments. I remember like just full transparency. My, the first job that I had, uh, I was talking to my dad around April of that year and he asked me how my taxes were going. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, April 15th, you gotta turn your taxes. And I was like, well, no, no they, they take that out of my check every month. <laughs> True story. And my dad was like, son, you have to fill out a tax form and send it in. I was like, say what? And then I had to learn on the fly real quick how to fill out a tax form. For some of you, it's that moment where you buy your first car and you realize, hey, I need credit. And you're like, wait, how do you build credit? Well, you gotta buy stuff. But then how do you build, like, I don't have credit so I can't buy stuff. And so there's all this confusion around getting a credit rating, right? Or maybe you're like me and you sur you're surviving right now on a combination of hamburger helper, ramen noodles, and mac and cheese, and a healthy dose of cereal. There we go. <laughs> and see, what I realized, what I thought was, if, hey, if I can, if I can like, brown some beef and put some noodles in, like, I'm, I'm a chef. Like, hamburger helper was my, my thing. I could do that. And I was like, man, I, I'm... I'm cooking now. Ramen noodles, I mean, there's spices involved. And so that like took my game to another level. Like I am, I am full on adulting now. I am putting spices on my noodles. But no one taught me that. Like the only time I, like when I was in middle school, I took home ec and I took shop class in seventh grade. I remember nothing from seventh grade. That should have been a college course, right? How to feed yourself as a single adult. How do you get credit? How do you invest in the stock market? What are taxes? Why do they take them out? How do you fill them? Like, we, like, we, we don't learn all these really important skills and then you're thrown into a season, you're like, go figure it out, good luck. Like I remember for, for a fact, like the day my dad told me I had to pay my taxes, I mean that night I had a hard time sleeping because I thought maybe I might be going to prison soon. <laughs> How many of y'all have thought that? You're like, if I do this wrong, they're coming after me. Like, I see your hands, absolutely. But here, here's why I share this. Like, like young adult years, we're just learning new skills. We're just learning on the fly with everything on the line, right? Your whole life. But there is one blaring omission beyond food, beyond taxes, beyond fixing your car, basic maintenance of a home, like all, like all these things. That's nothing compared to the massive miss that our culture, including our schools and our parents and our family, never taught us how to do. And that is how to handle conflict well and in a productive way. Look at our culture, guys, look at our culture. No one knows how to handle conflict well and have it be productive. Here's what I mean by conflict. I mean a disagreement. I mean an incompatibility of some sort. We're talking in relationship. That's what conflict is. So when I use this word conflict throughout this, this evening, that's what I'm talking about. That you have a disagreement with someone. That they have, they have offended you, they've hurt you, they've let you down. Whatever the disagreement or incompatibility is, I don't know about your schools, but no one ever sat me down and said, hey Andy, as a teenager, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna have disagreements with people. And you're gonna run into people who you feel are incompatible with you. Here's how you deal with it well. 
Guys, our, like this, is, this is the topic of our, of our culture. The world we live in is being torn to shreds because grown adults cannot conflict well and productively. They can't do it. So here's what, and, and, and here's the thing is, I say we haven't been taught, but we have been taught. All right, audience participation time. I want you to raise your hand if in your home growing up, conflict was avoided at all costs. Like you didn't talk about it, you just assumed it wasn't there. Raise your hand if that was your home. Raise, loud and proud, come on, hi, there we go. How many of you grew up in the opposite family of like, hey, we handle stuff like right away? Not afraid, not avoiding, all right. So here's the deal. That has impacted you in a way that now you are living out whether you know it or not. Like this is one of the most helpful, like this isn't a dating talk, but at some point when you're on like date three, four, five or whatever, like you're like, hey, yeah, we're actually, this is actually gonna happen. You may want to bring up the conversation like, hey, how did your family handle conflict? Because we just assume that everyone should handle it the way we do. And this is, the, this is, the, this is our problem, right? We are not ever taught how do you do this? The way our world functions is they, they, they have pitted people against each other. It is you versus me. And so what ends up happening is our culture has taught us that people are our opponents. Not only that, they've taught us that, it, that there is a winner and there is a loser in every conflict, which leaves one person walking away feeling victorious and dominant and the other person feeling completely deflated and defeated. Or maybe it's our culture has said, hey, that conflict really comes down to who's right and who's wrong. So one person is smart and superior and the other person is just stupid. No wonder we hate conflict. Those are the options. The options that our world offers is winner, loser. I don't know about you, but I don't wanna be a loser. So I'd rather not just deal with this so I'm not a loser. I don't want to be stupid. And so I, you know what? I'm just not, I'm going to avoid because I don't want to feel stupid. So no wonder we hate conflict. No wonder we hide from conflict. Or maybe you are on the other side and you're like, I look for it because I want to be a winner. And I want people to know I'm right. And so no wonder that we cling to people whether that's celebrities or podcasters or politicians or whoever, who they, they do it better than we do. And so I just say, I support them because they win. They're smarter than me, so I'm gonna connect myself with them. So I don't actually have to in enter into it. I'll just say, I agree with them. And that's the problem is there's no nuance then all of a sudden. And so here's what I wanna talk about tonight is this crisis of conflict because conflict naturally breeds arrogance. Because it involves our heart, it involves our ego, and it involves our emotions. Because I don't know about you, but when I'm in a conflict, I never walk into a conflict, a disagreement, or an incompatibility knowing I'm wrong. I believe I'm right. We all do. And so our ego is involved. Our emotions are involved. Our identity is involved when it comes to conflict. But we must inform our hearts and not follow our hearts in conflict, whether that's going, running to it or avoiding it at all costs. In Sunday school, you heard Craig talk about our Sunday school. We, we had a, one of our pastors teach this past Sunday and he gave a great line. He said, I, I always say we need to inform our hearts, not follow our hearts. He said, you need to disciple your emotions. I was like, whoa, that is, that's good. That's a way better way to say it. Is we need to take what we know here and inform our heart. We need to disciple our emotions. Because when we talk about conflict, we're talking about our emotions. We're talking about our identities. We're talking about our insecurities. And so we need to take what we know from God's word and disciple our emotions in conflict. And here's the deal. Our culture may wanna set up as you versus me, winner versus loser, right versus wrong, but you know what? None of us want those options. We actually want a third option. What I'm gonna offer you tonight is that God, through his word, gives us the third option that you actually want 
and that we crucially and vitally need. And so tonight what we're gonna do is I wanna, I wanna give you the why behind conflict. All right, we're, like this is such a big, we're gonna do two weeks on this. We, like, we probably could have done two weeks on sex because I did go like 50 minutes. But we thought, you know what? It's an interesting topic. We can go 50 in one week. We're gonna split this up into two. So tonight we're gonna talk about the why of conflict. Next week, we're gonna, I wanna give you some really practical tools of how to do conflict. How to give feedback and how to receive it, all right? So this week and next week are gonna build on each other. And so tonight, here's what, we're gonna be in 2 Corinthians 5. We're gonna go back to the, 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 the church in Corinth, right? We were there last week talking about sexuality. And this week, we're gonna talk about conflict through the words of Paul to the church in Corinth. And we're gonna be in chapter five, verse 17 through 21. Let me read what Paul says um, to the church in Corinth. Here we go. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, meaning they're a believer, they're a follower of Jesus, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Christ, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Guys, we could do an entire series on this section. You've heard some words here that God was reconciling us to himself through Christ. Like, that's the gospel. And here's, here's the, 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 the thing about this passage. Why would God need to reconcile us to himself if there was not a conflict? Guys, sometimes we play church and we go to a building because that's what you do in this area of the country, you just, that, that's what you do. It's become a, 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 a pattern of behavior versus a belief, and we play church. I'm here to tell you tonight from Paul's words, from God's word, that left to our, ourselves, apart from Christ, you are in conflict with the God and creator of the universe because we were born sinful. And I can prove that to you. I can bring you to my home and show you children that we did not teach to lie. We did not teach our children to manipulate. We did not teach our children to hit one another. We didn't teach our children to talk back to their mother. It is just in us. It's in us to rebel. And apart from Christ, like that, that, that's, that's what's standing in this verse. The, the therefore is like, we have a problem. We are in conflict. We are, we are in disagreement with God because of our sin. We are incompatible with the holy God because of our sin. And so Paul is bringing the good news of God through Jesus Christ. He has reconciled us to himself. He's talking about conflict here on a cosmic level. So here, I wanna get back to verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you are a believer, a follower of Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So here's my first point. Conflict is an opportunity to embrace not an obstacle to avoid. Opportunity to embrace. And some of you are like, no it's not. 
that is a terrible idea. <laughs> terrible, right? It's uncomfortable. It's in, it just, we avoid it because it is uncomfortable. When we have a disagreement, it's uncomfortable. When we have to go to someone or someone comes to us, it makes an awkward moment. That's what a disagreement is. That's what conflict is. And if you're an Enneagram A, you're like, yeah, say it for the people in the back. Let's go. Conflict, embrace it, people. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm not like, okay, eights, I love you. I know you're connecting with people through conflict or through aggressive you know, conversations, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about there's, there's a problem innately between us and the Lord. And God said, I'm going to embrace this conflict. I'm not going to avoid it. As Christians, we cannot afford to take our cues from the culture. We cannot afford as Christians to react to conflict the way that the world does. We cannot do it. Because one, it leads to the destruction of relationships. And two, it does not reflect God, our creator and Lord. Because he did not avoid it. He embraced the conflict. Paul says you are the new creation in Christ and so we do conflict a new way. We don't listen to the culture, we follow Christ. And so we have to say, how does the culture handle it? Go watch Twitter. It is the essence of, the, of what I'm saying tonight. Like we cannot do it, right? You could just say, the sun is bright today and the comment section will light you up. No, it's not. It's cloudy where I'm at, right? You're like, oh my gosh, okay. Like we, this is the world we live in. It's crazy town. And so we can't, as Christians, say, you know what? I'm going to meet the, the culture's energy when it comes to conflict. We can't do it. We have to be followers, believers, disciples. If we are believers, followers, disciples of Christ, we have to conflict a new way. And so then the question, probably through this whole series of Quarter Life Crisis, is really this. Are you a follower of Jesus or are you just friendly about Jesus? Like, are we actually going to say, Jesus, how would you have me deal with this conflict? Or, or, or we say, you know what, I'm friendly to your idea, but what I really wanna do is I wanna stick it to them. And I wanna win, and I wanna be smart, and I want them to feel the pain of being wrong. Because that's our culture. Ephesians 4, 29 what a wonderful passage it says this. Paul says, do not let any unwholesome talk. They didn't have internet, I'm so I'm talking talk verbally or by typing out words, right? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Our words, whether typed out or said, are you, are you catching this? It's not about you. Paul said, it's not about you. He says, every word that comes out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others. According to what? What you want to say? What, what acts you want to grind? No, according to their needs. What is helpful for what they need? That it may benefit those who listen. Our words are powerful whether they are typed out or spoken. And Paul is saying, listen, let no unwholesome talk. We're talking gossip. We're talking bad behind people's back. We're talking about ripping people to shreds, pointing out everything they do that's wrong, that they say is wrong, that we disagree with. And guys, I hate to say this, but the church has done, a, we've done a terrible job of this. And I think we're reaping the fact that we have been discipled by the culture and now we look no different than the culture. And so we, they don't see the message of the gospel, they see hypocrisy. And so when it comes to conflict, I would argue, I, like I'm, I'm a little bit, just a little bit older than you guys, what I would say is nothing turns off people from the gospel more than how Christians deal with conflict. 
because it's no different than the world. And if we don't handle and disciple our emotions differently than the world does, then what's the deal? Why would I submit to anything then? Why would I give my life to something that makes no difference in your life? Conflict is an incredible evangelistic tool because when we do it like Christ, when we take the heart of God and we insert it into our relational hardships, we will stick out like no other. So Ephesians 4, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only for what is helpful for building up others according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. So do not proceed in a conflict, in a conversation, if one, your motive is only to win. Do not proceed if your motive is just to be known as right. And don't proceed if your motive for arguing and entering conflict is simply to avoid dealing with your own issues. If you can just keep making it someone else's problem, you never actually have to deal with your own stuff. Conversely, if don't avoid conflict because it might be uncomfortable. It will always be uncomfortable. Always, every time. I've been married 18 years. Conflict is still uncomfortable. Don't avoid it because it's scary. Don't avoid it because it's inconvenient. Don't, don't avoid it because you might be on the, the, the wrong side of the argument. You see, God has led by example in embracing us, the offenders, and not avoiding us. So conflict is an opportunity to embrace because God has embraced it. Have you ever thought about this? God could have avoided it and said, you know what, you're dead to me. Romans 5.10. Paul writes this, for if, while we were God's enemies, did you catch that? While we were God's enemies, conflict, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? <laughs> That's crazy. That God, did you catch this? He's not the one in the wrong, but he is the one who initiated the resolution. If you're anything like me, oftentimes when somebody wrongs me or offends me, I'm like, well, they're the ones that's wrong. They should come to me and apologize. It's their job. I'm, I'm the good one. They're the one that were wrong. God didn't see it that way. He said, I am going to be the initiator of reconciliation. I'm going to send my son to earth to take care of this disagreement because we could not. You see, God's motive was to embrace the opportunity because it was beneficial for us, for him to do so. Guys, this is mind blowing. This is the kind of stuff that gets me excited about the gospel of Jesus that sometimes we just get so used to hearing is that we were enemies of God. He moved in our direction for our benefit. He embraced conflict. And so whether you are, you are conflict avoidant or not, we need to pause and change how we think about conflict. We don't allow the world to influence and disciple us. We look to the heart of God and his heart and intention was not to defeat you or to humiliate you or embarrass you, but to reconcile you. So we see conflict as an opportunity to embrace for the benefit of a relationship, not the end of it. I've seen so many young adult relationships and friendships that are in this room over the last eight years, that friendships that have just ended because they weren't willing to walk through conflict and actually have an ongoing discussion. It was like, this is uncomfortable, watch we'll us part ways and we'll find other friends. I've seen it happen in this ministry. That's not the heart of God because God has reconciled us. Verse 19, Paul says that God was reconciling to the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. So my second point tonight is that conflict is an opportunity to seek understanding and clarity. 
An oppor- conflict is an opportunity to seek understanding and clarity. God embraced us in the conflict because he understood and was clear of our terrible condition. We were not. That's why we speak. That's why we share the gospel. Because we are unaware of our situation. But God said, you know what? I understand the situation. I see it clearly. Therefore, I will make the move towards you to reconcile so that you can come to an understanding first for yourself to be reconciled to God. Because we were separated from God because of our sin. God was the initiator when he wasn't wrong. Why why is the cross of Christ so offensive to people? You know why? Because it clearly gives us an understanding of our need for a savior. The cross tells us that we have a problem between God and us, that we're not okay just as we are, that we're not enough just as we are. The cross tells us that. And we don't like that because we like to be independent and we like to be strong and we don't like to need anybody else and we wanna do what we wanna do, how we wanna do it and I'm a good person so I'll choose the right thing. But God says no, that's not who you are. You are separated because of sin and so I'm going to come and I'm gonna reconcile. He sees it clearly. Hebrews 4.15 says this, and this is incredible to me. For we do not have a high priest, Jesus, because a high priest is the mediator in the Old Testament between God and the people, right? That Christ is our mediator. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. What an incredible idea here. Only God could think of this, that, that, that God in Christ empathizes with our existence and our, and our situation as humans. Jesus entered into the conflict, right? He left heaven, entered and embraced the conflict. I'm gonna go down there. I'm gonna live their life, walk their world, and I'm gonna learn all about them and show them the hope that they have in me. And as he went to seek and save the lost, as he went to reconcile, you know what Jesus did? He experienced everything we do, yet was without sin and he empathizes with us. We have a savior who empathizes with us. Doesn't feel bad for us, he empath- empath- empathy is, is beyond compassion. It's choosing to enter into the pain of someone else, to come alongside them and empathize with them. We have a savior in Jesus who has empathized. He knows our life. He understands, and so he entered into the the, the conflict to understand what it was like to be human. What an incredible idea. Practically, this is a massive radical shift for us, that the goal of conflict is actually to understand and clarify. It's not necessarily to get someone to agree with you. It's to understand and get clarity of where one another are. Like that could be the goal. Like what a radical change that would be, right? Like if you walked up to somebody who you disagree with and they're like, tell me why you think that and how you came to that. Like I would love a discussion. Like that would just be like, I wouldn't know what to do with that. Because as soon as we have a disagreement, we, we kind of get our, our fighting hands up. Like, all right, let's go. I'm gonna win, you're gonna lose. I'm gonna be right, you're gonna be wrong. It's me versus you, you're my opponent. But Jesus didn't do that. He said, I'm gonna enter into the conflict to understand in order to empathize with those who I'm about to save. You know, if you have a sibling, I don't know how many of you have a sibling, but you know Proverbs 18, 17 very well. Proverbs 18, 17 says this, the first to plead his case seems right until another comes and examines him. The first one to get to mom has a huge advantage. Right, right? Younger siblings, we know this. We leave way earlier because the older brother's still sitting there trying to argue his case. We're like, I'm gonna go to mom and I'm gonna get her on my side. Make you look bad. And so what does a good parent do? 
a good parent says, oh, let's bring you both in. Let's understand what's going on. Let's hear out both sides of the story. Guys, our emotions always only tell us one side of the story. And so part of, a huge part of conflict is changing the goal, not to win, but to understand and, and get clarity. Because when we seek to understand someone, it forces us into a position of humility. When we wanna understand somebody, we have to what? We have to slow down, and then we have to listen to them. It forces us to be humble. It forces us to listen to someone else. And because it forces humility, because we have to listen, it then allows us and frees us to empathize with them, the way that Christ empathizes with us. You see, understanding someone and their perspective, allow, I'm not talking about agreement. I am not talking about agreement. I'm talking about understanding them. I don't know about you, but I wanna be understood. Like, you, you know those people that they just never stop this. You're like, you don't even know me, bro. <laughs> you know my name, but you never stop to actually get to know me. We all want to be understood. And understanding allows us to treat them with value as image bearers of God whom Christ loves and gave his life to redeem. They're not your opponent. They are the object of Christ's affection. And so when we start shifting how we view conflict, we have to shift how we view people. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, not to defeat and humiliate and embarrass the lost. Our culture would love to do the latter, right? Defeat you, humiliate you, cancel you, just destroy you. That's not my savior. He has come to seek and to save. And along with it, he empathizes. For God so loved, fill in the name that he gave his only son. Think about it that way. When you are in a disagreement with someone, when someone has maybe hurt you or let you down or whatever it is, whatever the offense is, let's not forget that Christ loves them just as much as he loves you. And so we are to treat them as a beloved person created in the image of God. They are not someone to be toyed with and tossed aside. Let's continue. Verse 19, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. My third point and last point tonight is that conflict is an opportunity and, 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 and an invitation to connect and reconcile. Conflict is an opportunity and an invitation to connect and to reconcile. That word reconcile, we've used a lot tonight. Here's what it means. It means to restore harmony or friendly relations or to make compatible once again. This is what God has done for you through Christ on the cross. That what was once incompatible is now made compatible again. And now we're his representatives. What a terrifying plan. Like, this is one of those moments where I'm like, God, are you sure this was the plan? That you would have people who you have saved and reconciled to yourself, that we would now be your representatives? Man, what a weight of conflict we carry. He has given us an immense responsibility to steward our lives in such a way because we are his representatives to the world. We connect practically. We connect and deepen with God first, right? What's he imploring? He says, please be reconciled to God first. Let's get this right before we work on this. 
And so we connect and deepen first with God. Guys, when it comes to conflict, I don't know anything else in my life that makes me deepen and depend on God more than conflict. There is not a day in my life that goes by where I'm not praying, God help me. Like just today, I had to leave work for four and a half hours to go home to mediate conflict. I'm like, God, please help me. I just wanna go in there and scream. I wanna go in there and light them up to respect their mother. It brought me closer to the Lord. (laughs) Conflict will deepen your connection with God. Because the heart of God is not afraid of conflict. He is willing to embrace it and show us how to do it. John James 4, 8 says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Connection. John 15, 4, Jesus says himself, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Connection. Conflict is an opportunity to connect with God. Proverbs 18 says the opposite. The one who isolates himself pursues selfish desires and who rebels against all sound judgment. That is the way of our world. You don't tell me what to do. Don't you tell me what to think. I will think and I will say whatever the heck I want. Unfortunately, that also bears fruit. And so we aim and hope to connect more deeply with people and with God because the heart of God is for us to be reconciled to him and that we would be his representatives of reconciliation to the world. And so our relationships with other people is of the utmost importance. Not just how we handle weekend trips or vacation or movie night or whatever. The most important part is how do we handle conflict between individuals as his representatives as ambassadors of Jesus. It changes the game. So first we connect with people and then we, or with God and then we connect with people. Matthew 18, you're probably waiting until I got to this if you know this verse. Matthew 18, Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and correct him in private. And so we need to, and it's gonna help us connect with other people. Guys, the opposite of connecting is disconnecting. And so I think Jesus is very purposeful in Matthew 18 saying, hey, if your brother has sinned against you, you need to go to him. Connect. Because what the enemy would love to do is disconnect. And just completely disconnect you from this one and this relationship and this one, and all of a sudden you're all by yourself. Because we're not willing to step in and and say, you know what, I I wanna connect with you. I value your friendship more than I value my comfort. I value you as a person more than I, I value not being, feeling awkward. Because guys, let's be honest. Conflict solidifies friendship. Like that's why when people go off to war and they sit in a foxhole together and they come back and they are lifelong friends. Why? Because they went through a conflict together. They worked through it. And I just wonder how many friendships and relationships we miss out on just in the body of Christ because we're not willing to conflict with people. It's just my comfort is too important. It's more important than you. I will let you go as long as I can hold on to my comfort. Like I don't, that just sounds super jacked up to me. That does not sound like the heart of God. Romans 12, 10, what if this was the goal? to love one another with brotherly affection, outdoing one another in showing honor. What if instead of winning, instead of being right, we just said, how can I honor this person? How can I outdo them in giving them the advantage, the benefit of the doubt, the kindness that they don't, I don't think they deserve? What would it look like? It would be a game changer in every relationship we have, whether it's family, friends, coworkers, whatever. It would completely change the world if the goal was not to win, but to honor and to reconcile and be an ambassador for Christ as we have hard conversations. But here's the truth. 
And I put this point very purposely that conflict is an opportunity and an invitation to connect and to reconcile. Because the truth is not everyone will take your invitation. You may try to connect. You may try to reconcile and they may not accept your invitation. Okay. Paul talks about that too. I love Paul. Romans 12, eight. He says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Reconcile, connect. As far as it's up to you, you are in charge of you. So as, it, as, much, as, as much as you can, live at peace with everyone, but not everyone's going to accept your invitation. And that is okay. So my encouragement to you is be faithful in conflict. Be humble in conflict. Be kind in conflict and trust God with the outcome. You be faithful. As far as it's dependent on you, you be kind. You be humble. And then trust God with the outcome. And I think you will be shocked at how healthy and productive your relationships become because someone knows that you value them more than comfort and that you value them more than your convenience. Because guys, let's be honest. It was neither comfortable nor convenient or fun for Jesus to leave heaven to reconcile you and I to God. It's not comfortable. It wasn't convenient, but he did it. And we are the ambassadors of that savior. And so he says, you now go, be ambassadors for Christ. And so in review, conflict is an opportunity to embrace, not an obstacle to avoid. It is an opportunity to seek understanding and clarity. And conflict is an opportunity and invitation to connect and reconcile. Now I have no illusions that you're gonna walk out of your time and be like, great, I'll do it. That's why you need to come back next week. I wanna give you some very practical principles and guidelines from scripture, like this is how we actually do this. This is how we actually have a hard conversation and this is how we actually receive a hard conversation. Because let's be honest, we offend people. We hurt people's feelings. We are not perfect people, we're not perfect friends, we're not perfect kids. And so there's a good chance at some point in your life someone is going to come and correct you. I wanna help you navigate and get a, a grasp of like how do we actually go to someone and how do we actually receive when someone comes to us? So what do we do with this tonight though? Number one, as we go into 120 seconds, this is what I want you to be thinking. Number one, spend some time praising and thanking God that he initiated reconciliation with you. Like, let's not worry about God, help me with a good day. God, help me, help me not, you know, this to happen. Or God, would you help this to w still happen or whatever? Just stop and God, thank you for initiating to reconcile with me. Secondly, as we think about conflict, I want you to pause and examine yourself. How do you think about conflict? Like, this, is a, this would be a great conversation between friends or in a community group, on a date? How, do, how did you grow up handling conflict? What was your family dynamic? Like we need to know that about ourselves. Those around us need to know that about us. That hey, I run from it like the plague. Okay, great, good to know. So that if you ghost me for two weeks, I know that there's a conflict that we need to have a conversation, right? We need this, we need to pause before we go into it or before we run from it, we need to pause and examine our hearts and our motives. Number three, we move from pausing to praying. We connect with the Lord, we deepen our time with him, and we ask for wisdom, which he says he gives abundantly. We ask for courage and the ability to be kind. Because guys, the culture we live in is foolish, it is unkind, it is careless. And so we cannot afford to do it the same way. And then lastly, once we've done these things, we praise him, we pause, and then we praise him. And then we proceed carefully and with humility. We proceed carefully and with humility. Now I would say if there's been a name that's in your mind with this entire evening, if you're like, okay, 
I know the person we need to conflict with. I want you to pray for seven days. And then I want you to come back next week and we'll give you some tools to actually proceed with. Can you do that for me? Can you take seven days and ask God to change your heart towards this person? Can you take seven days and say, God, would you help me forgive them when I do not want to forgive them? God, would you help me see them the way you see them? And would you give me the strength and the wisdom to be an ambassador of yours to this person that has hurt me, to this person that I do not like, this person that has belittled me? God, would you help me love them the way you love them? And then next week we'll come back together and we'll give you some very practical tools to move forward. We'll leave these up on the screen for 120 seconds. Maybe it's gonna be a time for you to praise and thank God that he has given you his son to reconcile you to himself. Maybe during 120 seconds, you just need to start praying. God, I know the person. And so it, we'll, we'll do that for 120 seconds and then we'll come back up and finish with a song.